gospel of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. <coughs> Please be seated. <clears throat> Reverend clergy and venerable religious, on this feast of St. Matthew, Apostle and Evangelist, which takes precedence over the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, we are reminded that Jesus came to save us from our sins. And our Lord is questioned in today's gospel, why do you spend time with these sinners? You know, why aren't you spending time with us Pharisees? You know, the, the upper crust, the elite. Why are you here for these good-for-nothing People. I mean, that was literally the attitude of the Pharisees. And they looked down very much on publicans, who, who Matthew was before he was called. And they had, the, I would say, the same warm affection for, for publicans like we have for the IRS. People that take our money. And not only that, the publicans did not mind, and so many of them actually gouged the the people the romans didn't care as long as they got their tax they were happy but if the publicans cheated and gouged that was fine by the romans and there wasn't much that people could sometimes do about that but jesus says i have come for the sinners jesus came to save us as long as we believe in him and repent of our sins and do his will, we will be taken by him to heaven one day. That's the good news of the gospel, which St. Matthew proclaims and all the apostles in writing or in, in their verbal teaching. And the apostles, what a lesson. How they failed our Lord. I remember one man telling me after a sermon I gave about the apostles. He said, Father, there, I feel hope for myself because I know I have failed. But I know, too, the apostles failed. But they repented and they learned from their failures. There's only one apostle that didn't repent, refused to learn from his failure. And his name is Judas. But all of the others, including the very head of the apostles, St. Peter, who denied our Lord with an oath, they repented, they wept, they were sorry. And Jesus took these 12 unlikely men. Well, there was one replacement for Judas. He was Matthias, and he built his church on them. But they were sinners. They were unlikely. They were untalented, at least some of them. They were illiterate, some of them. There's reason to believe St. Peter was illiterate. But this, is, this shows what God can do with those who believe and cooperate with God's grace and humble themselves. He can do much, incredibly much. As we reflect upon what Jesus, that Jesus came to save us, I think it's important that we remember our enemies in this endeavor. Jesus is our best friend. He is almighty God, become man. But let us be well aware of the three enemies that are going to derail us from Jesus Christ, from his church, from his holy mother. And I'd like to reflect upon that in today's sermon. What are these enemies? We need to know our enemies because whether we like it or not, my dear brethren, every day we are in a battle. Maybe that's why the saints were so happy on the day of their death, among the other reasons, because the battle was drawing to a close. And as long as they persevered to the very end, they knew they were going to be with God forever. But we do ourselves no favors if we ignore or minimize or deny the battle. 
we are in conflict. The book of Job says, the life of man on earth is a warfare. So we have to know our enemy. When, whenever troops are preparing for battle, what are they doing? They are studying their enemy. They need to know as much as possible about the enemy. Otherwise, the enemy may ambush them, may overwhelm them, may indeed kill them or, or capture them or injure them. So it's all about knowing your enemy. And lack of knowledge can be absolutely fatal. You read of stories in battle where because of a lack of the best intelligence available, soldiers died. And if only that information was available to them, they could have avoided that. Now, it can't all be avoided. The very nature of war is a terrible thing. People suffer and die in, in, on the battlefield. But battlefield deaths and injuries can be avoided by knowing the enemy better. So our enemies, who are they? The devil, the world. Well, actually, I'll start with the world, the devil, and our own fallen human nature. What is the world? The, the world is that spirit of, of materialism and sensuality. I, that would be my way of describing it. It's that spirit of, let's have our heaven on earth. And I believe there are two idols in particular that are worshipped by those that are of the world. It's the idol of money and the idol of pleasure. St. Paul gave us quite the insight when he said, the love of money is the root of all evil. I'm forgetting exactly where he said that. But he said that's the difficulty with money. It has that way of captivating us. And we have to use it carefully. Money is not evil in itself. But the love of it is evil. I remember a financial planner telling me when he had to deal with so many times when there was battles about over wills and inheritances. And he said, Father, he says, it's always all about the money. It's sad. Again, nothing wrong with financially planning and, and having your finances in good order. And, and you, you should do that. You're a steward. God gave you that. But we have to use money in the right way. And, and an example of somebody who was not using in the right way was St. Matthew, the publican. That was his downfall. Actually, that was the downfall of Judas. In, Jesus came by the publican's bench. Matthew was sitting there doing his detestable tax collecting, probably gouging the people. And Jesus said, follow me. And the gospel tells us he got up. He left, he left the table. He left the money. He left his accounting books behind. What, a, what an, an enormous sacrifice and effort that, would, that took for him to do that. And he never went back. St. Peter was allowed to go back to go to fishing because that wasn't something that was incompa radically incompatible with his being an apostle. But Matthew never went back to that, because he was called now to be a bishop, to be, to, to, to the, he was called to the priesthood. But he was saved because in his case, he was having a hard time not worshiping that idol. So, let us remember that we are stewards of, and ultimately think of God being the owner of your property, your money, and God has placed you in charge of it. Use it wisely, plan it. Use it for his glory as you take care of your needs. Use it for charity. The other, part, the other idol that's worshiped so much in the world is pleasure, and pleasure for its own sake. And this explains why there's so many addictions because people make pleasure their all in all and pleasure cannot give us true happiness god gives us pleasure so that we can fulfill a reasonable purpose 
But when we start to seek it for its own sake, it's like pouring gas on a fire. It, you always want more and more. It just explains why there's so many addictions to drugs, to alcohol, to the pleasures of the flesh, to sins against the flesh, unnatural marriage. People are seeking the pleasure as an end in itself, not what is the purpose of it. And this is why we, we practice self-denial so that pleasure doesn't take over and become that, that God in our lives, which the world makes so much of, pleasure and, and material things. But guess what? And I would say this to all the worldlings. You will have to leave it behind one day. No matter how much you have, you can't have it forever. You can't take it to the next life. And misuse of those things will only add to your misery and to your punishment. Let's use them in the right way, never sinfully. And then the devil who never sleeps and who has the experience of thousands of years and to his intellect was far greater than a human being's intellect to begin with. So just imagine how clever the devil is after all these centuries. He, he, he can learn too. He knows what works. In the screw tape letter, C.S. Lewis has, uh, mentions that one of the things the devil would like people to believe is that he doesn't exist, that he's just a myth, that he's a cartoon figure, you know, the, the little angry man in the little red suit with, you know, pointed ears and uh, a tail and a pitchfork, and people laugh at it. And why would C.S. Lewis say the devil likes it that way? Because, going back to what I said earlier, if you don't know the enemy, you don't know what your enemy's doing, your enemy will conquer you. So there we have the devil deceiving so many people, using, you know, adding to the problem of the world and their fallen human nature and, 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 and bringing people down, deceiving them into error, deceiving them into sin, always trying to show evil as good. But it sometimes comes even to a worse level than just pretending the devil isn't there or he's just a funny man in a red suit. When the devil has enough control, then he takes that mask off and says, worship me. And that's exactly what's going to happen in, in Oklahoma City at that black mass. The devil has them so well, he doesn't have to have them ignore him. He says to them what he said to Christ, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. And that is the horrendous sin. I would like to tell everybody there, do you realize you're going to be burning in hell next to the devil for all eternity? Does do you, do you have any concept of what it's like to live in fire? I mean, it's one thing to sin or fall out of weakness or, or, or ignorance, but this, there's no weakness, no ignorance. This is blatant, full, 100% malice and iniquity. In a better time in our country, this would have never been tolerated or allowed, but now the devil is being worshipped. how this will wound the heart of Jesus and the heart of our mother. He came to save us. He gave his life and his blood. And now his creatures will be worshiping his greatest enemy, the devil. We would never do that. I'm, I'm sure that out of love we will offer reparation to Jesus and to Mary. But remember, the devil... It's still out to get us. As he says, as St. Peter tells us in his first epistle, the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
He wants to get your soul. Fortunately, his power is limited, except for those that just put themselves right in front of him and put themselves in his power. But St. Augustine, I believe, says it's like a chained dog, you know, a vicious dog. And as long as you don't get too close and don't act foolishly and are aware of the danger, by and large, you'll be able to resist many of the things the devil's going to hurl at you. But just realize he's out to get you. Just imagine if you're walking through somewhere knowing there's a sniper somewhere in a building or in a tree. That's an image I think we could use for the devil. He's, he's, he's got his sights trained on us, and he knows us better than we know ourselves, I think. But with God's grace, with our guardian angel, with our Catholic faith, with our life of prayer and the sacraments, we will be able to resist him and not be deceived by him. And there's one thing the devil cannot do. And he told this to, to one holy monk. He says, he says, you know, you fast all the time. I never eat. You keep long hours of vigil, depriving yourself of sleep. I never sleep. But there's just one thing I cannot do. And the holy monk says, what's that? He says, I cannot humble myself. I will not humble myself. But you can and you do. So having said this about the world and the devil, still, my dear brethren, our greatest enemy is the one that looks at us in the mirror every day. Again, the devil's power is limited. If we're aware of the world, don't allow its corrupting influence. Stay out of occasions of sin. You know, we can control it that way. But how do we ever escape ourselves? We carry ourselves wherever we go. And we have a fallen nature. Each one of us has a predominant fault. And other faults. And each one of us has to know, well, what is my predominant fault? Which of the seven capital sins is my main weakness? I need to know that and work against it daily, and conquer these other faults as well. So, I, I know that's not saying very much about our greatest enemy, but we've spoken about it often enough. So, I'd like to just wrap up. Jesus came to save us. He wants to bring us to heaven. But let's fight the battle and fight it generously and strongly there's so much to be gained and so much to be lost we gain either god and the beatific vision for all eternity or we burn in the fires of hell for all eternity those that's our choice but remember jesus came to save us and he shows us by what he did to matthew how he lifted him up and made him so great and matthew just cooperated he said yes to jesus let us say yes to Jesus and know how much he wants to do for us, he and our Holy Mother Mary. And let us be their loyal soldiers. Let us win great victories for our King and our Queen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.